Welcome, everybody, to our uh, panel on the future of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the, sorry, Mike's not on? Uh, I want to welcome everybody to our panel on the future of the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, we have a terrific uh, panel here this morning. Um, I'll just introduce everybody very quickly. Um, to my left, obviously, is uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, Queen Rania of Jordan, uh, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, Bill Gates, uh, President Kagame, um, uh, Helen Gale, President and uh, Chief Executive Officer of CARE USA, and Paul Pullman, um, the head of Unilever. Um, you know, just to remind everybody, because the subject today is going to be the fact that in the year 2000, uh, 189 nations got together and agreed on uh, 50, eight uh, development goals over the next 15 years, uh, Millennium Development Goals, um, and uh, we're now approaching the expiration of them. And the question we really want to reflect on is, should we set new goals? Uh, uh, are some of these uh, more relevant, less relevant? Where have we made progress? And just to remind everyone what those goals were, uh, they were one, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, uh, two, achieve universal primary education, three, promote gender equality and empower women, four, reduce child mortality, five, improve maternal health, six, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, seven, ensure environmental sustainability, and eight, develop a global partnership for development. I think we'll just do this in the order we're all seated. So, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, I uh, wonder if you could kick us off. Uh, well, thanks very much, Tom. I I'll give you my uh, five quick points on what we should try and do uh, with this review of the MDGs. First point, let's not waste the time between now and 2015. Let's actually do everything we can up to and including 2015 to meet more of the goals. They have been inspiring. They have uh, inspired the world to raise their game. That's point one. Second thing is I hope that in the work we do to work out what comes next, we don't kill off something that's good and that's simple and that holds government to account. You know, there's always a danger of creating something incredibly complicated, mm. uh, very long, and basically governments will then slide off their responsibilities because we won't have those specific, measurable, deliverable targets. Third thing, I think we've got to keep um, that inspiring overall aim, which should be ending, eradicating completely absolute poverty in our world. We can do it if we look at how many fewer people there are living on $1.25 a day today than there were 10, 20 years ago, as I was saying on the stage today, it can be done. Fourth point, which I suppose should really be the first point, we must listen to the poorest people in the world and the poorest countries in the world about the things that they most want. The MDGs were fantastic, but there was a slight sense that this was uh, the rich world setting out a set of things that everyone should try and achieve. And, and I find when you hold listening exercise and you listen to people, you get an enormous amount that comes back, not just about shortage of money or shortage of food, but shortage of justice, problems of corruption, problems of bad government, lack of property rights, lack of an ability to get on in life. And that leads me to my fifth point, which is I hope we can include what I call the, the golden thread, which is those things that help countries and people go from poverty to wealth. The absence of war, the absence of corruption, the presence of good government, the presence of property rights, of free media, the ability to, to start a business, to employ people, to grow and to achieve your goals. Those things are absolutely vital, as well as the important health and educational targets uh, that are contained in the MDGs. So we've been given an impossible task by the Secretary General on the high level panel, but uh, we're going to proceed on the basis that nothing is impossible and try and build on what's been a great global success. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, Queen Rani, you've been working on a lot of these in your own country, um, uh, where you faced a lot of these challenges. What's been your experience? And is there anything on that list from your own work you'd say um, has got to be on the next list of Millennium Goals? Well, building on what the Prime Building on what the Prime Minister said, um, I think it's very important for the process to be inclusive. Uh, everybody has a stake in this, so everybody has to have a say. And I think in the Arab world over the past two years, uh, people have mo made their voices heard. And what we've seen uh, in my part of the world is as much of a demand for economic justice and freedom from want as it is for uh, political justice and freedom from oppression. I mean, we, have, uh, we are the youngest uh, region in the world with over 50% of our population under the age of 25. 
And the gap between what these young people expect and what they experience is very wide. And uh, that, that needs to be bridged. Mm. Uh, so uh, in, our, in our part of the world, we really need to achieve that economic transformation with individual countries laying down the national building blocks for growth and sustained prosperity. Mm. Um, our young people, do they just want to reach their potential? They want a chance to be part of the growth that they feel that they've missed out on uh, in the past. And a couple of things that we really need to focus on in our part of the world is a quality education. Today, the kind of education that our young people receive is not relevant. Um, uh, they are transitioning into adulthood unprepared and with a, facing an uncertain future. They need to feel equipped with the kind of 21st century skills that can give them a chance to fulfill their potential. Mm. Um, another issue is job creation, and here entrepreneurship uh, is, is a critical uh, thing that we need, we need to work on. And you, you visited Jordan, you saw that there's a lot of excitement uh, around entrepreneurship, yet um, the ecosystem, the, su the supporting ecosystem for entrepreneurship is, is out of balance because there is uh, plenty of red tape, um, uh, the uh, financial enablers are very underdeveloped, so only 88% of lending goes to small and medium-sized enterprises, um, again, the education gap. So a lot of work needs to be done in that regard. But uh, I think the uh, entrepreneurship could be a very important ingredient uh, as an engine for employment. Uh, and, and it's not until we are able to give our young people the skills that they need and the creation of opportunity for them that we'll see that transition mm -hmm. in, in the Arab world to, to a better future. Thank you. Secretary General. Thank you. This is a very good opportunity. As the target date of 2015 is fast approaching, discussing this matter, raising the awareness and importance of meeting the target of MDG at the Davos Forum among world leaders and business leaders is quite important. Before I go further, I'd like to recognize the presence of my distinguished predecessor, former Secretary General Kofi Annan, who initiated uh, this MDG in 2000 uh, together with the uh, world leaders on the occasion of a new millennium. And this has become our framework for development. MDG has been, I think, quite uh, successful in rallying the importance of uh, development, particularly for uh, poor people, abject poverty, uh, po poor people, how we can sustain this planet Earth in a more sustainable and hospitable way. Those have been, I think, our top priorities now. I'm committed to bring this MDG to a successful conclusion as mandated by the world leaders. As the moderator has briefly introduced, we have made the good progress so far. Uh, we were able to reduce the number of abject poverty by half. And that is the announcement uh, of the World Bank. And also, we have been able to provide uh, safe uh, drinking water. The number of uh, those people who do not have access to safe drinking water has reduced. And we were able to improve the life of at least 200 million slum dwellers to improve their living standard. All these are some, some of the achievements which we have done, including primary uh, education. Uh, Rwanda is one of the exemplary countries where they have been meeting this uh, target. Now, we have uh, three priorities, three objectives and priorities at this time. First, we have to keep our promise. We have to keep promise. That means we have to meet the target. The scorecard is not even, uneven, depending upon where you are going, depending upon the countries. That we have to make an even and harmonious accomplishment of this Millennium Target Goal. That requires political will at the political leadership. After all, we are living in a, in a world of limited resources. When you have limited resources, depending upon where the president and prime ministers will 
focus their national development priority, I think that will make a difference. So we have to make, keep our promise. Second, we have to have a good successor of this MDG after 2015. That is what we have already started. In Rio de Janeiro last year, June last year, the member states have adopted sustainable development outcome. And they are going to uh, discuss and set a sustainable development goals, which will be a carrying this MDG in a broader, a broader set. And I'd like to thank uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, who has willingly accepted the, our United Nations invitation to serve as a chairman of this high-level panel of eminent persons. He is working very hard together with President Yudoyono of Indonesia and President Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia. They represent both developing, developed, and emerging countries. I have asked the leaders to come with bold, but practical one. Mr. Polman is also a member of this high-level panel uh, sitting there. I'm expecting, on the basis of their recommendation, and also in close cooperation with the member states, we will be able to have the sustainable development goals reflecting all these 26 major issues identified by the Rio Plus 20 summit meeting. This is a top priority, number two priority. These SDGs, I think, should include most of the MDGs, but in a broader sense, it should include other issues uh, to make our world sustainable. That should be very clear, concise, and easy to communicate, as MDG has become a family household name. Everybody now understands what MDG is aiming for, that we have to make sure that what SDG is aiming for. Great. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I want you to take up this question, and I'd also like to add a question that I'm going to ask everybody um, uh, to, to reflect on. If you were to add one more, if there were one more to the eight, what would it be, knowing what you know from the work you've been doing? Well, it's fantastic how successful the Millennium Development Goals have been. Um, it's during this period that we've improved the human condition faster than ever before. Uh, you know, at the base, uh, which was taken as 1990, 12 million children a year died every year. And by the time we get to 2015, we'll be below 6 million. Uh, so uh, it's a 50% a reduction. Uh, and never, that's way faster than we've ever done before. And the idea of measurement is pretty key here. What happened was every country looked at their goal and they looked at their rate of progress and they compared it to the other countries. And they saw what were the tactics, the affordable tactics that really worked in the countries that did well. And basically for child to death, having a good primary health care system uh, and uh, great vaccine coverage is the primary determinant. And so countries like Ethiopia that went from limited primary health care to really investing in that, they've seen over a 65% uh, reduction in that child to death rate. And so people, for the first time, were learning from other people. And it made aid donors, instead of just having good goals and amounts of money in mind, it meant that they were going to the people who were following best practices as proven by progress. And so the aid community became more like the business community in being driven uh, by best practices and really saying, why did you do so well? Or for the ones who didn't, why did you do so par poorly? What's the contrast there? And we see that across uh, the different development goals. Uh, the fact there was consensus, the fact there was a limited number, we knew how to measure them, it really made a difference. Uh, and, and people actually shifted aid into the impactful areas, like health aid got a big boost during this period because of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, I'd say going forward, you know, I'd be worried that the most successful measurement exercise the UN ever did, everybody will want to piggyback that for their cause. Uh, 
And so the clarity that, hey, this is about the poorest and the tactics we use to help them. It's not really telling China how to run its country or the U.S. how to run its country. It's more about how the world community comes together for the countries that we still need work for them to be uh, self-sufficient. So personally, I would not add uh, a goal. I would update, you know, like four, which is the education goal. Yep, I'd put a little quality metric in. It was purely kids in primary education. Um, you need some quality measures in there. Uh, the disease goal, yeah, maybe it is time to add a few additional uh, diseases. And of course, we have to update what we think the target should be. Uh, I think in the next 15 years, we can cut childhood deaths in half again. I think that's very doable, and uh, you know that gets you down down to three million. But I don't think I'd add a whole new category. I think we're, I don't I don't know that that's uh, what's going to happen. But I'd leave it alone. I, it's hard to argue with success because uh, this success is measured in millions of lives. If you were to add a disease or diseases, what would they be? Well, the beauty, the dis infectious diseases are where you have magic solutions, uh, specifically vaccines. And they come in at costs that are very affordable uh, to the poor countries. For the things that we're getting in the rich countries, you know, we have $30 billion a year of government R&D working on cancer. So as you get cheap solutions, you want to make sure that what used to happen with vaccines, where it took 30 years between when the rich kids got it, who didn't really benefit as much as the poor kids who were exposed to the diseases, you want to make sure you're taking those cheap interventions and getting them out there. But for a lot of these diseases, we don't have those things. And the UN is not where the research is going to be done on cancer right. and, uh, and some of those things. We're starting in terms of blood pressure and a few other things to have very low cost off patent pills. And so uh, I would add uh, a heart disease goal that there are interventions mm. that the poorest countries can do there. But just, just two or three that wouldn't double the, yeah. the amount sure. of text in MGG6. <laughs> President Kagami. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Well, first of all, I, I just speak from the point of the opportunity I have had in, in two ways, one to serve on the advocates panel as, as a co-chair, but also coming from a country that has been right at the center of this and they benefited in many ways. And I will give testimony to the fact that the MDGs have been very valuable in many ways and also proof to what the world is capable of doing once it has committed uh, itself and come together around a certain principles. And here in this case, the world committed itself to the MDGs and, and seeing abject poverty eradicated and the fight against different diseases and so on and so forth. So this is to give a testimony that things have worked. And they have worked for a number of reasons. And the way to get more progress, as we have already realized, it has been to give local interpretation of what this means and what can be done. In other words, bringing in the local communities together with their governments and other partners that have been central to this. Has, has translated into improvement of lives on the ground. And from this, therefore, when we have in mind, as the Secretary General has uh, articulated, from here, how do we continue or where do we go? This means consolidation of what has been achieved already, where countries that have taken responsibility for themselves their governments, the local communities, the partners that have come in, we've seen good results. There have been good results in many places on our continent, in my own country, uh, through these uh, partnerships, partnerships that have also built on accountability. I think uh, Prime Minister Cameron mentioned that when it comes to governance, to accountability, to making sure that for every contribution that has been done for every dollar, 
there is the return expected in improving these lives. So we've seen countries that have taken ownership uh, register good results. So we can build on this for... Can I ask a follow-up, though, because you know this program so intimately from the inside, and, and no program is perfect. If there's one thing you'd recommend fixing going forward, what would it be? How can we make it better? Well, I think it, it, it should continue centering on the local situation, <laughs> because the local situation brings the local culture and innovation and, you know, people, even at a the local level, in rural areas, they have the kind of ingenuity really to contribute to mm -hmm. improving their lives. Uh, and I think it has been said, it's not that there are experts out there who come to tell people what they should be doing and they just do that. I, I think building on the needs of the people and their expressions is very important. But let me add something. We need not stop here. Much as I agree that the MDGs need to be kept simple and, you know, few and, you know, concentrate as, uh, as a central point, I think we need to be seeing this in a much wider context. How do we make progress on this, but at the same time have in mind that there are other things that would even improve the situation much better. For example, we can go beyond that and mobilize for public and private partnerships for bigger investments in other areas mm -hmm. that will actually mm -hmm. make sure that what we have achieved here hold sustainably. For example, when we talk about investing in infrastructure, it's a big thing. Maybe you may, it may even sound you are div, you know, diverting from what the original objective was of simplicity of these goals. But in a big way, if you bring in the private sector and mobilize, you're not necessarily committing yourself to bringing in the resources because that's another issue. But you can, we can use the power that is within the people who are advocating for this to mobilize, just mobilizing for that. Great. Thank important. you. Ms. Kim. Yeah. Um, well, uh, first and foremost, I think it is going to be important that we make sure that we do the most we can in the next 1,000 days. And, you know, it is clear success breeds more success. And I think the more we can do to make sure that we go for broke, if you will, for, for the time that we have remaining for the, the current MDGs. Um, you know, second, I think that the more we can learn lessons um, and improve upon what we did well uh, with the current MDGs, learn from that and continue to improve. And so I think some of the things that many people have said, you know, they were simple, they were measurable, uh, they were great in generating political will. Um, they had a, a clear focus, all of those sorts of things, and they, you know, and they really did have uh, the the effect of, of really focusing the world on poverty and the fact that it is doable to make uh, poverty, poverty history and eliminate poverty. So I think all of those things we should make sure that we maintain. And, and you know, I think the challenge will be that there, uh, because uh, people really felt they were so useful, that there will be this challenge of keeping them simple. Uh, the world has changed. There are many great needs, but I think the simplicity, the targeted, the focused nature of them really was what made um, us be able to achieve some of the successes that, that we have. So I think, you know, again, learn from what we know. The, the other thing, though, that the world has shifted, and there are some things that we need to look at differently. Climate change clearly uh, will have one of the greatest impacts on poverty <laughs> of any other uh, issue. And so whether it's food security, whether it's disease, income, all of those things, you know, climate change is going to have a huge impact. And so whether we need to have a climate change specific uh, MDG, if you will, or, or realize that that needs to be part of the framework. The issue of, of equity, I think, is, is something that we didn't talk about as much. Um, but even in countries where goals have been met, there's great pockets of, of uh, inequity. 
And within countries as well as between countries, inequity is, I think, an issue that we are thinking about more and more. And so I think looking at how do we make sure that inequity is included in the way that we think about, uh, about these issues. Um, you know, the, another very positive aspect, I think, in the original MDGs was the gender focus. It is something that I think that is important that we do not lose. We aren't there yet, and that was one of those cross-cutting issues that, um, that I think was, was clearly important throughout. Um, and so, you know, I think some of those are, are some, of the, some of the things that were really important that we need to keep, but make sure that we look at some of the, the new things. People have mentioned, and, and this is clearly um, both a good part, the participatory nature of the of the uh, the current MDGs, but they were in many ways seen as something that galvanized governments and uh, civil society, business did not have as much of a role. And I think being able to make sure that we really make this a multi-stakeholder effort and make sure that we do hear the voices, as uh, Queen Rania said, of the people who are affected by this, and make this something that really is seen as a global effort, still making sure that we maintain the poverty focus. So those are some of the sorts of things that I think both learning lessons, but continuing to innovate as we go along and recognizing that this second phase, this next phase, um, needs to be different and reflect how the world has changed. And just finally, you know, I, I think uh, several have mentioned that this was very important to galvanize resources, but we didn't think about resource considerations in, until somewhat after the fact. And I think we should go into this clearly with a financial framework up front so that in this tough economic time, we don't have any excuse to back away from the financial commitments that it's going to make, that it's going to take to really make sure that we continue to maintain progress. Let me ask you this, just quick follow-up as a aid provider. You know, um, should number nine be governance? That is, can we be effective with one through eight without improvements in governance? Yeah, I think governance has to be something that is, that is uh, whether it is a specific um, item or if it's part of a framework that we think about. And I think um, governance is clearly cuts across all of these issues. And I guess, you know, in addition to governance, the whole er area of conflict, uh, we just finished hearing about conflict and humanitarian emergencies, which didn't get as much focus the first time around, and both because of climate change as well as um, the uh, crises we can continue to see, I think we have to take that into consideration because it's having a huge impact on poverty. Paul, I'm going to go to you in a second, but I just want to ask the Prime Minister, do you think governance can or should be part of this in a, in a more high-profile way? I hope that it, I, I very much hope that it can. Um, because, and I think we have to grapple with this problem that some things that are very important in terms of helping people and countries go from poverty to wealth are difficult to measure. And where, where I absolutely agree with Bill is some of the things that we are measuring are simple, they're accountable, and you know that if you spend money, you can deal with them. You know, vaccination programs, children into school, these are things you can measure, and there are things where aid money can make a real difference. And, and these are the easiest things to measure. And I say this as the prime minister of a country that is very proud that we're meeting our goal of 0.7% of GNI to aid, uh, you know, and we're at a difficult time. But I make the argument because I think it's important that countries mm. keep their promises and there's a moral responsibility. But we should look at those things that are more difficult to measure but really do make a difference. Mm. And there's no doubt that... Um, governance makes a difference. And so I, I would, I'm going to cheat and give you two, two thoughts um, on uh, future things we should at least think about measuring. Maybe it's not possible, but let's take one, which is the importance of being able to own property, and for particularly for women to be able to own property. If you, if you don't have a proper land registry, if nobody kn knows what land you own, what your, whether you own your, your house, however small it is, you can't borrow money, you can't start a business, you can't expand the private sector. This is an incredibly important mm. issue that people like uh, Hernando de Soto yeah. have, have written so powerfully about. So I think we should think about that. Um, another one, as I've said, I find when you ask people, you know, what are you most lacking? 
Of course, there are issues in our world still about hunger, about undernutrition, and we should really hit those hard this year. But you also get the cry, what about access to, what about freedom from corruption? What about access to justice? So that, I think, is another area in the governance um, heading where, you know, I hope we can be bold and say, look, it is difficult to measure this stuff, but just because it's difficult, not, let's not give up uh, because it, it matters so much. So those are some thoughts. Thank you. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, for, well, the first thing on, on what is new now versus what was then is, in fact, the millennium, the last millennium goal that probably, um, including the private sector, was an afterthought. And um, with the courage of the Secretary General, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, and others, uh, you now have two members of the private sector on the high-level panel. And uh, if you think that nine out of ten people uh, in the world are directly or indirectly in the private sector, it is common sense that we're included. We've also discovered that it's not so easy to be in politics, so we have more respect for politicians now <laughs> since I started this job than I even had previously. Um, we just did a poll at the consumer goods uh, community here at the World Economic Forum, and the two things that are on everybody's mind is equitable growth within the planetary boundaries. This world needs growth. We still have two billion people coming. We start from a bad position. Over 200 million people unemployed need to generate 40 million jobs. It's become a global problem, by the way, not just one for the aspiring markets. And at the same time, we need to do that in a way that is sustainable within the planetary boundaries. At a moment that many of these biomarkers are already on sharp or are exceeded. And businesses increasingly see that as a limitation to that growth. So finish the job we get back from anybody in, in the business community. Clear targets, accountabilities is obviously what business likes. Focus on growth. We know how to do that best doing that in partnership, keeping the planetary boundaries into account. And, and that we need to play up, hopefully, a little bit more in the uh, goals that we will develop or in the upcoming meetings in Monrovia and in Bali. Within that, uh, food security is going to be a big thing. You cannot solve your poverty, the zero poverty, your job creation, if you don't attack the issues of food security and this. Again, Mr. Prime Minister, with the upcoming G8 and the conference we already had in Downing Street at the time of the Olympics, uh, to put nutrition in there, because it's not about calories, it's about nutrition, uh, is a very important thing. And when you talk about diseases, uh, what you asked Bill, I think the biggest disease, in my opinion, is going to be the chronic diseases. Uh, there are more people dying of heart attacks and the diabetes too, the obesity, on the one hand with the food, uh, we have a very bizarre situation in the world right now where you have 890 million people go to bed hungry, not knowing if to wake up the next day. 170 million children stunted as we now work with nutrition. Then we're able in between to waste about 30-40% of the food as if it doesn't matter with all the climate change effects on top of that. And then we try to figure out how another billion can eat more than they need and end up being obese at an alarming rate. So these are these issues that destabilize the world, but also destabilize the business community. And increasingly, businesses understand, even more so since, I believe, the 2008 crisis, that any system where too many people are excluded or left behind is not a system that's in equilibrium, is not a system that's good for business either. So we are at a very important point, I think, in humanity, and that's why I volunteered to be part of the high-level panel. Um, because we're, we're in a period probably of a decade, if we are honest amongst ourselves, and we've seen many manifestations of that in the last few days here, where the political process is kind of difficult to move things forward. And without going into the many things with the Doha rounds or the climate change agreements, the solving of the European problem, the outcome of Rio plus 20 itself, and yet, the time is ticking away. And the best chance we have, I believe, to put a, glo a global moral framework in place before we see others taking that place, uh, as we've seen in the past with, uh, with uh, nation states or institutions, uh, the Millennium Development Goals could potentially be the best opportunity we have to have that moral framework. And I think the current goals that have been in place, although not totally achieved, 
have been incredibly helpful for business. The Secretary General's Every Woman, Every Child, for example, got, got over $1.6 billion from business. We just came from the uh, Scaling Up Nutrition Zero Hunger, $3 billion. These are enormous things that align business communities to get the results. So let's not miss this opportunity that we have. Finish the job between now and 2015, and then put goals in place that we all align ourselves under between now and 2030. And hopefully then we can go home and look our children in the eye and say, we don't even try, or we didn't even try. We actually made this a better world for all. Okay. I'm going to go to the floor um, for questions in a second. But Bill, I, I want to get you to um, follow up on the Prime Minister's point about governance, that you're, you're running the world's biggest foundation. You're dealing with multiple governments all over the world. You can, should that be part of this? I completely agree that quality of governance is such a key factor in where we see progress. Uh, the, the question I would have is who's good at rating governance? Uh, so for example, the World Health Organization at one point tried to rank health systems, and those guys were fired because the member states don't like being rated by the organization they control. Hmm. And so what I would say is what Mo Ibrahim's done, uh, build, taking people that we support, like Transparency International, the, his governance index, which covers a lot of the different issues, mm. is phenomenal. I don't think we'll do better than that. And I think if we gave it to the UN, we would politicize it. Uh, you know, what would the US ranking be? It right. better be one, number one, uh, or maybe not. Uh, yeah. And so the question is, who's best yeah. equipped to criticize governments? Right. Is it a club of governments or perhaps not? I gotcha. Let's go to the floor and uh, please, uh, if you'd identify yourself and uh, if you want to pose the question to the whole panel or to any, anyone in particular. It's a little hard for me. We got, oh, right over there, gentlemen, right there. Lights are up, great. And they're going to bring you a microphone. Peter Pro from the Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance based in Geneva. Thanks to all the panelists for their brilliant uh, interventions. One comment, I didn't hear, I don't think, anybody refer to human rights. Reactions? Very much part of the golden, I mean, I would say the human rights are very much part of the golden thread and, and you know, all those things which aren't always about money, but things that actually help uh, people to enjoy uh, prosperity rather than, than poverty. And so access to justice, freedom from corruption, human rights, you know, democracy, a free press, all of these things are essential. And, and uh, I, I would respond to Bill by saying that, you know, if we're going to take the public with us on this, yes, they absolutely back action to vaccinate children, to make sure kids are going to school, proper health outcomes. But the public knows that if you have corruption, if you have conflict, if you had bad governance, all the aid in the world won't solve the problems of poverty. And I think we, we need to have franker conversations. I mean, for, for instance, Britain and Rwanda have a very close relationship. Britain's a big investor uh, in terms of aid into Rwanda. But when we have disagreements, as we have recently over the conflict in the DRC, we, we should be frank in saying so. I think we need a we shouldn't be frightened of disagreeing with each other. We shouldn't be frightened of opening up this debate. And we shouldn't be frightened of talking about human rights, governance, freedom from corruption, and above all, freedom from conflict. Because if there is war taking place in your country, it doesn't matter what else is going on. You will not make a journey out of poverty uh, into prosperity. Secretary General. Let me briefly add to this human rights issue. Human rights is one of three pillars of the United Nations Charter. So this is an absolute value and principle, which in every aspect of United Nations uh, missions or activities, that's a basic principle. There is a serious problem of human rights. There are many countries where human rights are grossly violated. Then what to do with this aid and development? And in a country where Good governance is not the practice, or what to do with that? We had the very serious uh, discussions. Uh, we call it the chief executive board meeting. All the heads of United Nations agencies, including World Bank and IMF, we meet twice a year under my chairmanship. And we discuss all the issues, starting from uh, 
political issues and development issues and human rights issues, and how we can work together as one team. That's one good principle. On many occasions, the questions have been raised. What to do with this particular country where human rights are grossly violated? Then what about uh, development? Of course, the development side, they said, we have to help to bring prosperity and economic development. And human rights department and agencies, they said, we have to make sure that as long as they do not respect and uphold human rights principle, we have to uh, rethink. My, my answer was that human rights is an absolute value principle. Therefore, human rights should prevail over all the issues. Of course, you know, there are counter arguments. When the security is not assured, people cannot protect the human rights. But there is a very important principle of accountability. Whenever and wherever, even though it may be uh, some time after, the, those human rights perpetrators will have to be held accountable. This is a firm principle. So just because nobody has mentioned uh, human rights, that does not mean that we are not taking care for uh, let's, human let's, rights. Great. Thank you. Let's try to get a couple more questions, if we can, right down here. If you could introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, my name is Sabreet Kaur. I'm an assistant professor of economics at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question is directed uh, specifically at Bill, but uh, uh, anyone else who has thoughts. You mentioned that uh, one change you might make to the education goal is to add a quality metric, and um, that really resonates with me because I, I think it's true that even though we've increased enrollment by a lot, um, people are, hundreds of millions of kids are exiting school systems uh, without basic literacy, without basic math skills. So I was wondering if you had thoughts on what quality metrics might actually look like, and also um, ideas or things that you've seen in your experiences on what uh, ways people have actually been able to um, improve quality at scale in uh, public school systems. And uh, Queen Ronnie, could I ask you to follow up with Bill, because you've run your own teacher's academy, I know, and I'm on. So Bill, go ahead. Well, the, this is actually an area where the OECD does a fantastic job. Um, they are able to take education at various levels, reading skills, math skills, and do very good global measurement. They do it uh, extremely efficiently. They do in-depth interviews about the tactics that different uh, countries use. The thing that always jumps out is it's about running a personnel system. Uh, if you make sure your teachers show up, you make sure they're evaluated, you make sure they have ways of improving, then you have a great education system which large parts of Asia do. Uh, and if you don't have enough feedback and don't run that personnel system, then you're, you're, not, you're not gonna be up in the top rank. So it's, it's really about how good the teachers, the teachers are. Queen Rania, what's been your experience? Yes, your question really speaks to my region because we're a region that has invested a lot in education. And although we've achieved uh, much better rates in, in terms of access and completion, uh, the relevance and the quality of our education has been uh, trailing behind. So uh, schooling for us has not been synonymous with learning, unfortunately. Um, and I think that that is a key ingredient to changing the situation in, in our part of the world. And teachers, again, I, I will um, just reemphasize what Bill has said. It's such an important ingredient. For example, I remember just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, I went to visit a remote village in the south of Jordan. Uh, I went to a classroom uh, for sixth grade girls, and they had just taken a creative uh, writing class. So this was, this was a group of 30 girls, um, uh, 12 years old, and they were sitting there, you know, debating, very engaged, very focused, discussing their feelings, their, you know, their fears, the, the challenges, their hopes and dreams. There was this one particular girl I remember, her name was Noor, and she stood up and she was uh, telling us about her story. She, her story was about her grandmother, um, who was a famous storyteller in the village. She had entertained generations, you know, young and old, with fa famous uh, folk tales. And Noor was saying, well, my grandmother narrated other people's stories. 
I want to narrate my own, because I, she stood up uh, very proudly and said, I want to be an author. And I can't tell you how proud I was of this little girl in this remote village, um, not exposed to very much in her life, but already plotting her future, because she had the kind of education that's empowering her to be the author of her own future. Now, the point of this is that moments like these in classrooms don't happen by coincidence. The teacher of this young girl had just completed a three-year uh, training uh, course at the uh, Teachers Academy in Jordan, which we established in 2009 in cooperation with Columbia University. Um, and this is the thing. I think good teachers teach. Great teachers transform. And they can really be drivers of change, not just in schools, but across society. Um, this academy had reached about 6,000 uh, teachers out of 75,000, which is nowhere near uh, enough. But I've found that um, failed programs, I, don't, I try not to lose any sleep over failed programs, it's the successful ones that I worry about, which brings us to the issue of scale. Mm. In, in any government, uh, in any country, in order to try to have the impact that you want, you have to make scaling up success a, an explicit part of your long-term planning. You also have to make sure that the goals are, are dynamic and time and uh, place sensitive. Uh, so from our experience, teacher training is absolutely essential. Uh, you have to scale the success up. You have to make sure that governments are involved. You have to make sure that partners and donors stay engaged uh, in order to see uh, the, the impact. Most importantly, it's about the public. You know, when the public demand a better education and they make it a priority and they make their governments listen, then chances are that this will move up the national agenda for the country and achieve the success that's needed. Because across all of the Millennium Development Goals, and we're grappling with what should be and what shouldn't be, and our world has changed, but in many ways it stayed the same. Um, economic empowerment can deal with most of the issues. And, and, and education, the quality education, is absolutely essential to achieve that. Deborah, one more question. So um, uh, got to, I, I can't see so well. Is anybody? Right down here, one more. And I, I want to make sure that uh, Mr. Pullman and Ms. Gale and President Kagami uh, get a chance here. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Nilmini Rubin. I'm a Young Global Leader alumnus. And um, I work for the Information Technology Industry Council. I um, wanted to push back on something Mr. Gates said about measuring corruption. There, in addition to Mo Ibrahim's great index, there are lots of other measures. The International Budget Project has a measure of budget transparency, and um, I think it's a really important underpinning governance of all of the other Millennium Development Goals that we all care about. And my question is to President Kagame. Do you think that the beneficiary countries, or in your country, would be uh, able to be comfortable with a governance measure? President Gami, then if you'd like to take any of those, Ms. Gale and, and, uh, and Paul. Yes, let, let me deal with the two issues uh, briefly. I, I try to be as brief as possible. First of all, I think the, the, the last question raised is key. And, and building on what Bill had raised, who, who is right or who is well placed or better placed to give us a measure of, of governance and so on. It's a, it's a very tricky area because, well, so governments may not be able to benefit from other governments doing the criticism or, or something like that. But I still think there are issues even with the so-called independent institutions, like the one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, when you look carefully across the board, so many countries rated differently, you see politics in it. Mm -hmm. This is the experience. I'm telling you from the experience on the other side. You see, independence is, is really subjective. It depends on where you are standing. So, but if you have a number of these organizations acting independently, then you can look at across them and get a feel of what really is correct. Not relying on one, because there is not a single individual or a single country or institution that we can say has a monopoly of being right in making the judgment. So if you have many doing it, 
then you bet, stand a better chance. But let me quickly answer something also to do with human rights that was mentioned. Because there is, there is a, a, a problem here, in my experience over the years. Again, it's the same question. Who really has the monopoly or the sole right to define? Because there are some gray areas. There are human rights that are obvious. When they are violated, you see that. You know who is responsible. You can't do that. But there are others. The definition keeps changing. And you also find in the process of judgment a lot of politicization. And in fact, that judgment being used to make decisions, even if they are policy decisions or other decisions, depending on who they are having in mind, not because of what has happened. So it's a real problem. So it calls for a serious debate. Human rights are rights lived by people. They are not things that are just abstract. And there is not a single person, there is not a single country, there is not a single institution that has the monopoly of defining what human rights constitute in that broadness. Thank you. Ms. Gale. Yeah, well, um, on just touching on a, on a few of these, uh, you know, I think there, that clearly there will be issues like governance and human rights that will be difficult issues to tackle. They are political. They are tough to measure. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be debated. Um, ultimately, they may or may not end up in the next set of um, goals. But I think that they should be debated and they should be discussed. And we need to push ourselves. And I think we need to push ourselves on the things that we know really do make a difference for people. At the end of the day, if we're able to end poverty, that will go a long way towards human rights and social justice. And so I think if we continue to remember what is it that we really want to make sure we do, we want to make sure that we have a more equal and more just planet. We want to make sure that people have healthy lives, that they have the opportunity to make a living, that they have the tools to do that, like education, um, that they are free from hunger. And if we continue to think about what are the big things that we know make a difference for people, and how do we do those in the most practical, focused, measurable way, you know, I think we will come out of this with a set of goals that we can live by, that we will fund, and that will make a big difference, and we will go a long way towards those. That said, I think that there are key things like human rights, like governance, and other issues that we should grapple with, um, but uh, until we really come up with answers and not say no until we've actually had those discussions. But I think we don't want to get to the point where because things are tough that mm -hmm. we don't develop consensus on the things that we can actually move ahead on. And I think that's why that's this great. set of Millennium Development Goals mm -hmm. really had an impact because we came to consensus on some things that we could do. We've, we've made some progress. And I think if we can keep that framework in mind, then we will continue to you know, move towards our broader goals of a better society, a more just world. And as you said, being able to look our children in the face and say that we didn't just stand there and not make the world better. Paul, we're going to give you the last word. Yeah, I'll make it one minute, and I don't want to build on what has been said, but I want to come back to your question, because you introduced yourself as a young global leader in the technology sector. And these are two things we haven't talked enough. Half of the world population is below 25 years old. So the young are going to get the answer. They happen to be 50% of the world population today. By my calculations, they happen to be 100% of the world population tomorrow. And they understand better what is going on than we do, what it means to have a sustainable and equitable growth, what it means to have a governance or rule of law, whatever words we want to put around it, where everybody gets a chance. And these people are indeed in the technology sector. Two and a half billion people are connected on the internet. Soon we will have 50 billion connected devices in the world. And increasingly, especially the young, know how to use this. And we see some of these manifestations already, often led to frustration, because with age, or lack of age, if you may say, is lack of experience. So if we can provide the frameworks, they certainly have the energy and the power. The third nation in the world right now 
after China and India is Facebook with over a billion people on social networks. Mm. And increasingly we see that on any of these things, how it moves governments. You get an awful situation in India where a girl loses her life in tragedy. And finally, a million people on the street. And within a month, you have the court system set up. And rule of law is hopefully taking place for, for, for things that we would expect to be normal anywhere in the world. So we have to enroll in this process the young. We have to figure out how to better leverage the social networks that are giving us many more opportunities to hold all of us accountable on what we do. Which brings me to my last thing. We have a very limited period of time. It was Viktor Frankl who said in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, that when they built the Statue of Liberty on the east coast of the United States, they forgot to build the Statue of Responsibility on the west coast. All the people in this audience were very fortunate to be on the liberty side, including myself. I wouldn't have been sitting here were it not for that that we have to give everybody a chance in this world as well. But as we have that liberty, we also have that responsibility, that responsibility to participate into what the next post-2015 development goals are going to be. They're our goals, they're the goals for the future of the planet, they're the goals for the future of humanity. So please, 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 reach out to the high-level panel or the Future We Want website or other things to give your opinion. This is not a moment to be a bystander. We won't get there otherwise. So thanks for your help. Paul, thank you. It was a great wrap-up. Thanks to all our panel, and thanks to all of you. Mm -hmm.